Hi there. I'm Dr. Kim Meyer. I am an audiologist, I'm a deaf educator, and I am assistant professor at Worcester State University in Worcester, Massachusetts. Um, today I'm going to be lecturing on introduction to language deprivation for deaf and hard of hearing children, what that means, and we'll do a little bit of some activities as well. So let's get started. So if you've taken an introduction to audiology class, um, you may have listened to what hearing loss sounds like, but if you haven't, um, or you haven't taken the class, that's okay. Um, I'm gonna do a little bit of a review on what hearing loss sounds like. I wanna start with hearing, the terms hearing, and the term understanding, which are two different things. So let's talk a little bit about that. So audibility is when speech is heard, but not clearly enough to understand what is said. So you're hearing the vowels. So for example, if I say, it's happening to the short. Maybe you understood some of it, maybe not. You heard the vowels, it wasn't clear. You heard me. You heard that I was talking to you, but you didn't understand what I talked to you. When we talk about intelligibility, that is when speech is heard clearly enough to hear those word distinctions. You're hearing both the vowels and the consonants in what was being said. Okay. Oh, and so in the uh, previous um, example, what I said was, this afternoon we're going to the store. You understood all of the words that I said. You understood my message. I also want to share um, this kind of description of hearing versus understanding um, from an Instagram account called uh, Audiology Outside the Box by Dr. Sarah Sparks. She is a deaf audiologist that uses cochlear implants. Um, so she describes hearing as, you know that sound happened. You might know what so what kind of sound it was. It, if it was somebody talking, you might know whether the message was for you. The message might or might not have made sense to you. You might have had full access to the message or maybe not. That's hearing. You know something is happening, but exactly what it is, not so sure. Understanding, you get the meaning of the message. Doesn't matter how it's presented to you, spoken, signed, cued, written, or communicated in another way, text messages. The message made sense. There are no missing pieces. You're not uh, concerned about anything you've missed. You're okay. You've got the information. That is understanding. Okay, so now knowing between the difference between hearing and understanding, let's kind of move on. So often people think that if you have hearing loss, you don't hear anything. And that's not true at all. It's not all or nothing. This is a clip that I often show my uh, public school teachers when I do some public school consulting um, that kind of is an example of hearing versus understanding. Um, so this is Charlie Brown uh, from a, the old cartoon. Um, he is talking to his classroom teacher. You can hear his teacher talking, but you don't understand the words. And it's important to realize that sometimes that happens for people with hearing loss. They know people are talking to them, but they don't understand the words. So let's take a listen. My hand is smarter than I am. Yes, ma'am. What am I doing? Am I talking to myself? Yes, ma'am. I was talking to myself about the spelling bee. Yes, ma'am. I'd like to be in the spelling bee. Okay, so you heard her in, you, you knew that there was intonation, there was inflection, but you didn't understand any of the words she said, essentially with her trumpets, but he was responding like he did understand her. And from his answers, you knew what the questions were. So, so this is, that is the difference between hearing and understanding. He, you did not understand her, but he did. I feel strange. This is another clip I often show my public school teachers um, when I do consulting. Um, there are different levels of hearing, um, hearing losses, um, generally between mild and profound. And I have those listed there on the screen. Um, it's really hard for people to kind of wrap their heads around, well, what does it sound like? This is a, a, a pretty good um, you know, demonstration of it. The one thing I wanna realize is mild even mild does not mean no big deal. All hearing loss is can be can miss information. 
Um, so this is a, a the Flintstones, also another older um, cartoon. And um, you're gonna see on the screen that it's gonna tell you what the hearing levels are um, as, as you kind of, um, the voices get quieter, they get more distorted. Um, the more hearing loss a person has, the more distortion that they have, uh, that they experience. So take a listen. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh-huh, you're on my apartment building on Granite Avenue. You owe me 300 bucks. Get it up? Well, take it easy, it's only a game. Well, uh, just like them big tycoons, I play to win. Now, Barney, pay up or get out of the game. So as the hearing loss um, increased, the distortion increased. It was much harder to understand. Um, but again, even with for people with mild hearing loss, you might have caught all of the words there um, on this on the that the, that was being said during the mild hearing loss segment. But for many people with mild hearing loss, it still can be very challenging um, in many different listening environments. So all hearing loss can impact a person's ability to understand speech. This um, graphic is from a, um, a, a web and a, a blog. Um, it's called the Living with Hearing Loss blog uh, by Sherry Eberts. Um, wonderful blog. Um, and so her uh, the graphic is originally says hearing aids are not like glasses. Um, I added uh, and cochlear implants. So um, because neither one is like glasses. Now one of the things about glasses is you put glasses on, and for the most part, most people can see normally. And so that's really the 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 vast difference between hearing and uh, uh, vision glasses and hearing aids. Um, just because you're, you're wearing hearing aids does not mean you're hearing normally. In fact, you're hearing through a system that is uh, very distorted. And so when we put glasses on and we can see, people like to say, oh, well, it's the same thing as hearing aids. It is not at all. So um, Sherry Ebert's kind of, created this from her in her um, her blog, which I'm gonna kind of go through a little bit here. Um, so they don't, hearing aids do not restore hearing to normal. Um, they're gonna be louder. Things will be louder, or not always clearer, making it difficult to understand speech. They amplify all sounds, including those you don't wanna hear, like the hum of the refrigerator or other background noise. They're not seen as fashion accessories, although some hearing aids now come in colors and ear molds too. Um, they often remain shrouded in stigma and shame unlike glasses, which make you look smart. Um, I always have to look and see. Oh, they're not regularly covered by insurance. Sorry about that. Um, making them prohibitively expensive for many folks. Um, they need batteries to function. They can increase sensitivity to loud sounds. They can squeal at inopportune times. What does that mean? Well, if you're um, wearing hearing aids, and you're chewing, you know, the, there's a little muscle, um, the bone that comes right here in front of your ears. Well, when you're chewing, sometimes the the um, it can cause your hearing aids to squeal while you're eating. Or if you go in for a hug um, and somebody comes up close to your hearing aids, it can start to have feedback. Um, so that is the squealing at inopportune times. Um, they can't get wet. Um, and they're easily misplaced and sometimes can be... Um, uh, assumed to be a, a snack for the dog, which I've had lots of children have their hearing aids chewed up, unfortunately. Okay, let's take a little pause. And I want you to start, I want you to think if you're, you know, either if you're in a class of folks or if you're by yourself, um, I want you to think, did so far have I discussed language acquisition of deaf and hard of hearing children up until this point? So if I have discussed language acquisition, give me a thumbs up. If I have not, Give me a thumbs down. I'll wait. Not discussed language acquisition yet. Okay. So now we I this is an introduction to language deprivation lecture. I have to I have to define what language deprivation is. So let's go, let's do that now. This when I'm using the term language deprivation, I'm referring to this definition. It is a deaf or hard of hearing person that has normal cognition, 
but does not have a strong foundation in any language. And when I mean any language, I am saying a spoken language. So either a English, spoken English, or a heritage language. For example, if the family speaks Portuguese or the family speaks um, German, the child doesn't know either of those languages. American Sign Language, which is um, the language that is used by those who live in the United, deaf people who live in the United States and in uh, English speaking parts of Canada. Or another country's natural sign language. So the French, excuse me, the French speaking uh, parts of Canada uh, use um, uh, LSQ, which is their natural sign language, or British sign language. Australian Sign Language. Um, so those are natural sign languages, just like English, uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and French are natural spoken languages. For a child who is language deprived, they do not have a, a, a strong foundation in any of those things. I wanna talk a little bit about the impact for deaf and hard of hearing children. Um, so every state has what's called an early hearing detection and intervention program. The, we, the acronym is, is pronounced EDI. Um, and this is an opportunity for, to. this is how we started to, you know, how do we diagnose children early? That was kind of the, the, the big question back in the early 90s. Um, and so we follow what's called the 136 rule. Um, and the, so the goal of EDI is that every ba baby born in the United States gets a newborn hearing screening by one month of age. Their diagnosed hearing levels are by three months of age and they start early intervention or kind of, you know, if you're not familiar with that term, um, working with someone um, uh, to learn language by six months of age. The goal is for deaf and hard of hearing children to meet typical developmental language milestones in spoken or in sign language. However, the critical issue is that hearing loss is either not identified early or um, early intervention does not use an accessible language and that will result in language deprivation. Now language deprivation can have some really negative connotations. People like, you know, if, if it's not defined well, that's why I defined it the way I did because I want us to all kind of think about the same in the, in the exact same way. Language deprivation is a child does not have access to language at all spoken or signed. So let me repeat that. The goal is for deaf and hard of hearing children to meet typical developmental language acquisition milestones in spoken language or American Sign Language. I'm saying those children who live in the United States. Okay, so I want you, I'm gonna read this and then I want you to kind of maybe discuss what you think this means. A deaf child can be born with a brain fully prepared to acquire language, yet be inadequately exposed to a language the brain can fully perceive and internalize. Take a moment, you can stop the, stop the video and maybe discuss with each other. So um, this is a, a, from a wonderful book um, by uh, Dr. Neil Glickman and Dr. Wyatt Hall, uh, Language Deprivation and Deaf Mental Health. I have this book right here on my desk. Um, and it is what happens, you know, if you're, if you're really interested in taking a dive, it's a great book to learn about what happens when language deprived children grow up and ha still have very limited language um, and it really how it impacts their ability to learn and uh, their ability to uh, their social emotional growth. Um, this is from uh, the while the the quote is from the the book I just mentioned, um, the graphic is from a, uh, a, a an American Sign Language fluent speech language pathologist um, definitely communicating. So I um, highly encourage that you uh, connect with her as well. Okay, one to more time for emphasis. The goal is for deaf and hard of hearing children to meet typical developmental language acquisition milestones in spoken language or American Sign Language. So we're, I'm not prioritizing one language over the other. If a child, and I've worked with many hundreds, thousands in my 30 year career of deaf and hard of hearing children whose spoken language acquisitions were fine 
they're right where we would expect them to be. Um, and that's awesome. I'm not prioritizing any language over another. I'm just saying a child needs a fully accessible language, whatever that looks like to them. And we need to monitor that. So the, I actually have this on a t-shirt and I wear this for my language deprivation lecture that I, when I give my uh, to my uh, undergraduate and my graduate students. Um, and we talk about this. You know, one of the things that many people who don't really understand deaf and hard of hearing um, language acquisition will, and, and sometimes it's speech language pathologists will say this, well, you know, hearing loss causes language delays. No, no. If we don't intervene in, in the proper way, if we don't provide the right supports, if we're not providing the, the right intervention, um, then it's language deprivation that is causing language delays. Um, we, I expect that children are not going to be have language delays um, if we're all doing the right thing. And, and there's a lot to that. And, and I don't mean to put pressure on a lot of people, but there's a lot of things that need to happen in order for language deprivation not to happen. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that as well. But when people just kind of blame the hearing loss, that's the problem. We're, it's not a hearing loss not solely a hearing loss issue. It's how we have not provided enough support in order for children to be able to access language the way they need to. This was a um, uh, an article published uh, a couple of years ago. Um, in the, one of the, the things I've looked at is a lot of um, neuro um, neuro linguistics literature, um, and what they're kind of looking at as far as language deprivation and brain activity. So this article is titled, Restricted Language Access During Ch Childhood Affects Adult Brain Structure in Selective Language Re Regions. Now you notice they're not using the term language deprivation. Again, it can be a controversial term, but the way they're using it is very similar. Restricted language access during childhood. Okay, let's kind of break this, start, this, um, this study down a little bit. So they had several comparison groups. Um, they had one comparison groups of hearing adults who did not know sign language. Very much probably like those of you watching this video. You have a fully um, uh, spoken language. You've, you grew up speaking that language your whole life. Um, and so they were the, controlling, the control group. They had deaf adults who learned sign language before age three. So these were considered native sign language users. And um, so they, that was another group. And then the third group were deaf adults that learned language, sign language at age four years or up. So they were considered late sign language users. And this article showed that MRI brain scans showed that language re regions of the brain of the late language users were underdeveloped in comparison to the hearing adults and to the deaf adults who were native sign language users. So there is impact when we don't teach language early that it changes the brain structure. Let me explain this and then I'll read it. So um, we have that 136 that I mentioned before, right? Um, um, ident um, a di uh, uh, screening babies hearing by one month, um, diagnosing hearing a loss by age three months and early intervention by six months. So that is our 136. The CDC, the Center for Disease Control, um, put out a, in uh, 2000, I think it's 2002, um, I'm sorry, 2020, um, had, put, had said, okay, well, we're gonna, you know, we wanna collect more information um, about what happens after six months. What happens after we get those kids to that 136 then what happens to them? So let me read this to you. And then I'm going to have you pause the video and kind of discuss it a little bit amongst yourselves um, about what you think this means. So I'm going to read it. While collaborative efforts by the CDC, states, and other partners have helped lead to the early identification of thousands of children who are deaf or hard of hearing each year, their developmental and language outcomes are often unknown and these data are not routinely collected by the CDC or state early hearing detection and intervention programs. Furthermore, it is currently unclear what actions beyond early identification should be taken by public health to help reduce adverse consequences of hearing loss and ensure that 
children who are deaf or hard of hearing are ready for success in early childhood. At this moment, take a pause, put the, um, you know, can stop the video for a moment. And if you're in with a group of people, talk about what you think this means. Oh, wait. Okay. So basically what this is saying is we know what happens when babies have their um, their newborn hearing screening at one by one month. We know what happens when the um, they're diagnosed by three months. We have a good sense that the children are making it to early intervention um, by six months, but we don't know what's happening to the children after early intervention. What is happening to their language? We don't have that information. We just don't know. Um, you know, there are some hospitals that that will um, track their own clients, which is great, um, and and they might have that data. Um, there's some states now that are um, trying to keep track of that, but we don't have a comprehensive program that looks at language acquisition all all across all children. Um, doesn't matter where they live. Doesn't matter what audiologist they go to. It doesn't matter um, whether they're learning spoken language or sign language. We should be collecting all of that information. And so there's it's there's still some pro a lot of progress that needs to happen there. Um, but I think we're starting to make some. The questions are being asked, right? This is a question that's being asked by the federal government. Great. Um, now let's collect that data. We're not there yet, but um, I'm hoping that that will happen um, within my career. Okay, I wanted to share this a little bit. Um, Dr. Matt Hall is a, a professor at um, Temple University in their Communication Sciences and Disorders program, similar program that, that I teach in. Um, and um, he's doing a lot of work on def uh, language deprivation. Um, and and uh, he's kind of looking at it from a framework perspective. So from his perspective, um, language deprivation in deaf and hard of hearing children is often due to one of several issues within this four kind of um, you know, parallel plane, uh, uh, framework. Parental decision-making, language access, language proficiency, and developmental outcomes. Hold on to that for a moment. I'm going to kind of go over here a little bit. So this is the National Association for the Deaf. Um, and they put out their position statement on early cognitive and language development and education of deaf and hard of hearing children. And so I'm going to um, uh, read a couple of um, uh, uh, sentences from their position statement. And then we're, we're going to go back to um, Dr. Hall's framework and see how it applies. So one of the statements says, often medical and audiology professionals counsel parents to deprive deaf and hard of hearing children, especially those who are implanted from ex of exposure to sign language input. <clears throat> language deprivation is the harm that results when a child does not receive sufficient language input to acquire or learn any language or readily develop cognitive capabilities. Okay, we're gonna take these two sentences, phrases from the position statement and apply them to Dr. Um, Hall's framework. So going back to the first statement, often medical and audiology professionals counsel parents to deprive children of sign language input. This is informing parents, you should not do that. I'm gonna give you my professional recommendation as an audiologist, and I am an audiologist. You should not sign to your children. It's not. It's not a, it's not correct information, um, but so telling parents not to sign and believe me, I'm still meeting parents that are told by their audiologist, by their doctor, do not sign with your child. It's wrong information. The next phrase, language deprivation is the harm that results when a child does not receive sufficient language input to acquire or learn any language or readily develop cognitive capabilities. Um, this is this language access, uh, ability to access information is within the environment. So just because let's say a family is saying, you know, we want our child to learn spoken language. Okay. And their child wears, maybe wears their hearing aids and people just talk at them. Just because you don't talk at a child 
that with hearing aids does not mean they're going to pick up language. It has to be intentional. There has to be really specific teaching that has to happen. Um, or if we're doing sign language, just kind of signing in front of kids and not teaching them is not the way that they're going to pick up American Sign Language. So you have to be very intentional about teaching language to deaf and hard of hearing children. When we're talking about language proficiency, so um, going back to the sentence, um, the child does not receive sufficient language input to acquire or learn any language. Um, and so their language proficiency, they're not able to, to meet those skills, you know, or maybe they're getting very splintered skills and can't get up to that proficient level. Um, and so we need to, again, be very intentional about we, the way we teach language to make sure that deaf and hard of hearing children can learn it. And the last part of that sentence, or readily development, uh, I'm sorry, or readily develop cognitive capabilities. Um, and so this is the consequences of developmental outcomes. If a child is not taught language, um, if they don't have access to language, if parents make decisions based on, on wrong information, then it can impact their ability, to, their brain ability, which we just saw in the, in the previous, uh, uh, previous slide. It's challenging to be the parent of a child um, who has a disability, who has hearing loss, who has all of these, because it's par parents, the, for parents meeting a deaf child, it might be the first deaf person they've ever met who's their own child. Um, and so how do they, how do they navigate? How do they figure things out? Um, it's really hard. So what are the challenges the parents might have of deaf and hard of hearing children? Um, well, first of all, we talked about, you know, the, the early intervention providers, the majority of them do not have expertise working with deaf and hard of hearing children. And so many of them might ha not have that high expectations. Many of them might think, well, yeah, hearing loss causes language delays. It's still a, a very prevalent myth. Um, and so if you don't have someone with that expertise, you, you're, you're not going to be able to teach the parents how to be ad uh, effective advocates. Finding time to meet with an early intervention provider just around work schedules and other children's schedules. That can be hard. Learning how to teach their child sign language or spoken language, getting the right people on your team to, to do that, that can be really hard. If you live in a rural area, that can be really hard. Um, costs of cochlear implants, of hearing aids. Um, and there are you know, many, some states now will cover the uh, have laws that cover um, require insurance companies to pay for hearing aids, but often parents are paying for that out of pocket. Um, many of the insurances do cover co cochlear implants, um, but again, navigating systems can be really hard for many families. Having a child wear their hearing aids or cochlear implants consistently, that's hard. Um, you know, if you ever try to keep shoes and socks on a child, uh, that can be hard. And then trying to keep hearing aids on, on as well. So, um, and, and if, again, if a family's goal is spoken language development, they may or may not be able to, um, you know, keep that, keep them on all the time. So it's really hard. Um, I have this just as kind of a, a little bit of an aside, it's not not deaf and hard of hearing specific. It's really just language and 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 family specific. Um, you know, I'm the also the mom of a now adult woman with autism, um, and children with disabilities have medical and therapy appointments or intervention appointments, however you want to stay at it. Um, it's really it was eye opening for us. My husband he quit his job because we needed a parent to stay home with our daughter. Um, and it becomes a real challenge for families to feel, figure out how to negotiate their, their life, their employment. Um, and so being really aware of that is really, really important. Um, the Forbes story that's here, raising a disabled child creates an employment challenges you might not ever have considered. Um, that is really basic to families um, with a child with, a, with any um, uh, either a disability or, or deaf or hard of hearing, um, it's really a challenge. And so just being, a, just aware of that um, is important. Okay, some facts or myths time. So I'm gonna go through each of the numbered um, ideas here. And um, I want you to kind of, I'm gonna give you a moment um, after each one. And I want you to think, is that sentence true? Is it a fact? If it is, give me thumbs up. 
Um, if you're like, no, that's false. It's a myth. We're going to, we're going to give it a thumbs down. Okay. So let's, uh, let's kind of go through each one and then we'll kind of see what, what's the response to each one. Okay. So number one, American sign language, ASL is English on the hands. Is that true? Yep. That's true. Or nope, that's not. American Sign Language is a natural visual language with its own phonology, its own morphology. Um, if you've taken a spoken language or you've learned, you know, taken a, a, a phonetics class, um, you know, to learn about uh, uh, language acquisition, spoken languages have as well. Um, it does not follow English grammar, just like Portuguese does not follow English grammar. French does not follow English grammar. Um, and so, it is not English on the hands. It is a completely different language. Okay, number two. A family signing American Sign Language will prevent their child from learning how to talk. Is that true? Or is that false? It's false. Learning any language promotes language learning. American Sign Language supports English language learning, both spoken and written. You know, when I was an early audiologist, and I've been around a while, so, um, we were told um, by our, our supervisors, um, tell parents who, who don't speak English, um, who, who English might be their second language, don't speak your heritage language to, your, to the child, which we didn't call, you know, don't speak your first language um, because the child needs to learn English. The deaf and hard of hearing child needs to learn English. And um, these were families who English was not their most, their, their strongest language. And so, we know now that that was wrong, wrong information to give to parents, but that was the prevalence of the, of the times. Um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, we were telling parents, don't speak your, don't speak Spanish to your child. You need to, you need to learn English so he can learn English. Nope. Don't hard of hearing kids can learn more than one spoken language too. Um, and so if, you know, again, if all of the, the pieces, the, the, the intentional teaching is happening, they can have access to that as well. Okay. Number three. People who use cochlear implants, deaf and hard of hearing people who use cochlear implants or hearing aids cannot be part of the deaf community, meaning they cannot be part of, you know, um, the, the folks who use American Sign Language, they cannot be part of the, the you know, the, the, um, the deaf culture. Yeah. Not true. Just not true. There are many folks, and I have many friends um, who are co um, uh, in, within the deaf community who also use cochlear implants or also use hearing aids. So uh, I'm going to figure out my computer now. Parents must decide if their child will use spoken language or sign language. And hopefully by now you kind of figured out that this is a eh. um, families don't have to choose. They can have. They can do both. And I'm going to give you some a uh, little video, little video in a few minutes about what that might look like for some families. Okay, I have a couple of, uh, uh, this is a, an ASL Mythbusters video that I'm gonna show you. Um, and let's kind of take a watch. Doctors are people that we trust in, and when they tell us something, our first instinct is to believe them. However, for many deaf children, this can be what leads their parents astray. There are three myths that almost all doctors will tell their patient when it comes to deafness. Number one, using ASL will damage the auditory tissue in your brain. Connie Holmes works for the National Association of the Deaf. Hey everyone, good morning. She says that most people think audio and visual languages are processed in different parts of the brain. However, research says otherwise. That means that one part of your brain is used to understand language and that portion doesn't care that it's signed or visual. It only matters that the brain actually be given language. That would make myth one busted. The second says that learning ASL will hurt the child's ability to learn to speak. Beth Benedict works at Gallaudet University. 
and says that ASL does not hurt your ability to learn speech. In fact, research has shown that signing helps with speech development. One group had cochlear implants and signed, while another group had CIs but didn't sign. Do you know which group had the most proficiency when it came to speaking? The group that signed. It was not just speaking, but the kids are also reading and writing better than them. And that decision to wait to give children language what they learn to hear with their cochlear implants can be detrimental to their development. Just wait to teach the child? No, teach them sign, add in speaking, then you'll see them flourish. You need language, and then you can learn to speak. This means that when doctors advise against signing, it's just a preconceived fear that isn't actually factual. <sighs> the most notorious myth that doctors tell parents are that deaf children will graduate from high school reading at a fourth grade level. But not everyone is graduating at a fourth grade reading level. It's all from, well, maybe some are from third or fourth grade, but really it all ranges all the way up to college. That statistic was based off of a study done in 2000 on high school students' SAT scores. First, look at whether the SAT is a good form of measurement. It would appear not as less schools are using it. Secondly, with the 2000 study, remember that most of the high school students at that time would have been born in 1988. This means they weren't in scan at birth. The average age of detection was two and a half to three years old, and that meant years of missed language acquisition and time when parents didn't realize that they needed to be involved. You can't apply it to today's children. Now 95% of the children are identified at birth. Really, there's many factors. It's because people keep telling kids that, oh, you read at a fourth grade reading level, it's because you're deaf. But even after a multitude of studies have proven these myths wrong, we're still seeing doctors and audiologists and medical professionals telling families not to sign. Many students tell me how they were raised only speaking because their parents had no idea ASL was an option. Gallaudet University houses a renowned research facility that's working to disprove these myths. And the NAD is working to spread that message. I'm going to get in touch with the education advocates. Those advocates work with the NAD's Education Advocates Program. When it comes to deaf education or early intervention, they are ready to serve the community and work with them together. Both women agreed that the decision to not use American Sign Language is due to myths like these. There are teams at the NAD and Gallaudet University working to advocate and research how these myths are actually false. This is the final story in our language equality series. The goal, to show parents of deaf children why a bilingual approach is most important. You'll be able to find these stories and more on our website. Sorry about that. Let me get over to you. Okay, sorry about that. Let's get back to my. Here we are. That's what I wanted. Okay. Um, next, I want to show you um some clips, and I'm hoping this works. Um, I took so um this Instagram account, Christina Pax. Um, they. Christina and her husband have a daughter named Riley <clears throat> and Riley was born deaf and uh, now has bilateral cochlear, cochlear implants. So bilateral means in both ears. Um, the family has committed to a bi bilingual American Sign Language and English um, and bimodal speaking and visual language approach. Um, and there's a whole lot of little videos here that I want to show you and I've set them up and I'm hoping it works. Um, so let me um, just... Use all sound. Okay, I am now going to
and show because we're going to go to and I'm going to share screens. Give me one second. For doing this, I need to do this too. Okay, so this is um, the first uh, slide that I'm going to, uh, the first Instagram account I'm going to show you. And there's going to be no sound to it, but it's a it's a video of the family working with um, a, a deaf person on a um, on a Zoom call. It was during um, uh, during COVID, and um, allow and and just you can just see how they are communicating with the families. There's Riley there, and the family, the the uh, the Pax family has all of their family members in a in their living room, um, learning sign language from the deaf um, instructor on Zoom. And she's talking about the boats um, and how to use their hands and use their mouth instead of their mouth, um, use their facial expressions in order to communicate, which is lovely stop this one. I'm going to go to the next one. Does he? So this is, um, they are going grocery shopping um, and um, their parents are using voice off and they're using to practice um, using American Sign Language with their daughter. So they were practicing using American Sign Language in the Trader Joe's. It just shows that how, what they were doing. This is the next video I wanted to show. Now, she so let me just, they um, started with reading to her in American Sign Language, and now she's reading back to them. She's reading to us. What, what, what to see? So they're reading um, Brown Bear, which is one of my favorite books. Um, so we'll go on to a little bit more. She's a little bit older now. They, look, they do look a little different, very close. That's the frog. This is the turtle. We did it. So they just showed her how she's playing and using both signs and spoken language. And then this is the one um, that I showed at a conference that I did recently. Um, there was, a, this is, uh, she had just turned three years old or she was about to turn three. 
um, there was a fire drill at school and she is explaining to her parents what happened at the fire drill at school and, and preschool. Um, when she talks about having mouth time, that's what her, when she's working with her speech language pathologist. Oh, I just we go outside and there's a mom thinking that I know what happened when I'm going to go outside. Why not? Oh, everything. Everything is here. Everything is back to my time and put that on. Mom, you have to finish me and you have to finish me too. Why not? So you can see the family incorporated American Sign Language into her life. Um, and, you know, if, if they hadn't, you know, maybe her cochlear implants would have been okay, but maybe not. And they, this ensured every step of the way that she had language access, whether she was wearing her hair implants, whether she wasn't, if she's in the bath time, can't wear your implants in the bath. So um, it's a it's a chance to uh, to try things, to, to, to give language at all times. Um, all right, let me go back to my lecture. I can find it here, and I will. Oops. Okay. Let's do that. I make sure I'm in the right place. Okay, this is where I wanted to show you. Uh, so we've I've shown you this these um, these videos. Um, okay, so speech reading or lip reading is not as easy as you think it might be, um, and so I'm going to show you a, one more. Um, uh, this is a, another Instagram account, the Aerial series on Instagram. Um, the video is only captioned. There is no sound. Um, so you'll have to read the the, uh, the captions, um, but we can, uh, I'm gonna have you just kind of watch that. I did not want to stop share. I want to continue. I want uh, we'll keep going. Hold on. I want to get back to, What happened nope. at school today? Actually, we watched this one. We're going to watch the one after this. So asking people to read your lips is actually, can you can you read my lips is kind of considered a rude question. Um, and so, but taking out your phone and, and typing what you can, what you want to communicate is really the a, a, a super effective way of communicating with somebody to make sure that they understand you, you understand them. Um, okay, let me go back to my lecture. Okay. So one of the things I tell all of my students is to keep expectations high. 
if you are a Worcester State student and you continue to take um, uh, classes in our department um, and you're gonna get me um, when I teach CD 400, which is the introduction to oral rehab class, looking to change that title, but um, you're gonna get sick of me hearing saying that about high expectations. Um, that is exactly what we all need to be doing um, as future clinicians, as future folks who might be working with deaf and hard of hearing people, um, keeping those expectations high. So I have one more video I want to show you um, about keeping expectations high. Um, so this is a, let me just get rid of this one. I use controls. Um, uh, this is um, Dr. Featherstone. He is uh, going to talk about his experience as going uh, applying to medical school, working as a physician, um, and I think his in, uh, the uh, the information that he has that he wants to that he's going to share is going to be really valuable. When I enter into the patients' rooms to do evaluations, assessments, and physicals for diagnosis, or when developing treatment plans. I have an interpreter in the exam room with me. I place the interpreter behind the patient rather than by my side where it would create a distraction. In the many years that I have been in medical practice, I've only had about three patients complain about the logistics of the interpreter, three out of a countless array of patients I have worked with. The reality is that I have to be the one to set the expectation from the minute I walk in the room. Hi, I'm Dr. Featherstone. This is the interpreter. How can I help you today? I was accepted by a medical school, which was great. I filled out and returned the paperwork they sent. After it was accepted and approved, I got in touch with the school to kindly request an interpreter. They immediately had concerns about cost, logistics, and whether or not deaf people were even capable of attending medical school. This went on for months, and my request for an interpreter morphed into an analysis of my capabilities as a deaf person and not about finding an interpreter. At this point, I had attended BYU and had already worked for one year as an operating room technician. During that time, I had demonstrated that I was able to perform multiple tasks in the OR, including work with other doctors. I received a certified letter in the mail that informed me that my enrollment in medical school had been canceled and that my acceptance into medical school had been regretfully withdrawn. The reasons were threefold. First, my attendance would mean changing the curriculum for the medical school. Second, in an emergency situation, a deaf physician poses a risk to the patient. And third, that a deaf person is a distraction to other students and will negatively affect their educational experience. Those were their reasons. I was taken aback by this. I started with doing some research in hopes of finding other deaf doctors. I found one deaf doctor on the AMPL website, the Association of Medical Professionals with Hearing Losses. I found this neat fellow, Dr. Christopher Moreland. I asked his opinion, and he was able to put me in touch with a phenomenal lawyer. And they validated that I was not wrong. I showed them the evidence and emails I had collected that proved I had been discriminated against. My lawyer wrote a letter to the school warning them that this would result in a lawsuit if they didn't remedy their error. He gave them one week to respond. We heard nothing back, so we went forward and filed a lawsuit. Just before medical school was about to start, I had my pretrial hearing where the judge ordered that I attend medical school while the lawsuit was in progress. So I started med school. The legal proceedings took two years. So those first two years of medical school were stressful with my studies, plus going to frequent legal meetings preparing for trial. It was tough. Finally, one day, the school called and indicated they were willing to negotiate and work together to find a resolution. We did, and from then on, everything went well. Clearly, we deaf people have a lot more challenges than typical, but we shouldn't allow that to stop us. We must keep trying, 
even if you fail, get up and try again. Don't think that you're alone in your roadblocks, because you're not. You have a full army of people behind you, rooting for you to keep going. And he's now working as a pedi pediatrician. And this is when we keep language expectations high, when we keep potential expectations high, when we we take away all the barriers to language deprivation, this is what's possible for deaf and hard of hearing adults. Um, so thank you for learning with me and for keeping expectations high for deaf and hard of hearing people. That is my email. Um, and I, again, if you're a Western State student, I look forward to seeing you in the future. If you're not um, and you want to get in touch, please do. I'm happy to, to chat with you um, and to learn a little bit more. Um, and thank you for coming along with this Rethinking Oral Rehab um, uh, lecture with me. Thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.